group has its serious problems these days, and that is also true of the Children of God, the informal and loosely knit movement of young people who have turned on to God. Here's a report. Well, hey everyone, this is Rick, and I'm making this video, um, well, for many reasons, I guess. Uh, I suppose the main reason is that I want there to be some record of the way I feel. Um, my ideas, just who I was, really. Um, the goal is to bring down those sick fuckers, Mama and Peter. My own mother. What an evil little cunt. God damn. How can you do that to kids? How can you do that to kids and sleep at night? I don't fucking know. Anyway, I'm not trained in torture methods. Which is what I'm gonna have to make do. I got my drill here. The reason why it's got this fucking padding on it is just to try to silence it a bit because I'm in an apartment. Um, I got gags, fucking socks. <laughs> I got lots of fucking duct tape. Um, I got a soldering iron. Heat. Rather crude implement. I think can work wonders, especially if it's used in the right way. I'm not trained. I don't know how to fucking do this. I don't want to fucking do this. God damn it. A young man calmly loading cartridges into a clip for a for a pistol. What you are watching here is a videotape made by a young man named Ricky Rodriguez in which he talks about the murder he intends to commit and then after the murder his own suicide. This is a story about a group that once called itself the Children of God. The Children of God. The Children of God have come to England. Hello everyone. Welcome to the first episode of True Grime. My name is Alec Green and I want to take you along with me on my journey into the darkest corners of human history. This first episode, we will be diving into the life of Ricky Rodriguez, also known as Davidito. His experiences growing up within the heart of the Children of God cult, his eventual crimes, and his heartbreaking conclusion. This episode will contain descriptions of violence and murder, as well as censored visual examples of child abuse. This is a very heavy subject and not for the faint of heart and I want to very clearly give a trigger warning regarding child abuse of both violent and sexual nature. Please be advised before continuing. All visual examples given of Ricky's childhood abuse were found at xfamily.org as well as movingon.org, websites put together by former members of the cult to spread awareness of their crimes. I want to give an additional trigger warning for suicide. Viewer discretion advised. Ricky Rodriguez was born on January 25, 1975, on the island of Tenerife in the Canary Islands of Spain. Better known as Ricky, from the moment of his birth he was thrust into a life of abuse and anguish at the hands of those who should have loved and protected him most. His mother Karen Zerbe was the companion of David Berg, the founder of the Children of God cult, which thrived in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, though was still in existence to this day. Started in 1968 in Huntington Beach, California, under the name Teens for Christ, the group would travel from one location to another, performing music to witness to those they came across. At first, Berg preached a simple gospel, prophesying the second coming of Jesus. 
But as his popularity grew, his sermon became more disturbing. Called to live and die for the kingdom. As the group grew in numbers, they changed their name to the Children of God, and David Berg veered toward an apocalyptic message and discouraged influences from the outside world. Over the years, Berg's emotional and mental grip on his followers grew tighter through religious manipulation and fear of the end of times. By the mid-70s, Berg had introduced a practice to his followers called flirty fishing. Flirty fishing was a form of religious prostitution, heavily encouraged to his followers, teaching the young girls of the cult to lure men into joining the cult, using their bodies and sexual favors. It was at first only practiced by Berg's inner circle beginning in 1974, and by 1976 had spread to the rest of the cult by way of regular publishings of illustrated newsletters sent out to all members, known as the Mo Letters, Mo being short for Moses, one of his aliases being Moses David Berg. He was also commonly referred to as dad and grandpa by his followers. The Ten Commandments were done away with by the law of Jesus Christ, the law of love. God not only has one law, the law of love. Just this one law of love fulfills all ten and all the rest put together. So we don't need them anymore. We're no longer under the laws of Moses. We're no longer under the Ten Commandments. We no longer run at all that religious follower all and rigmarole. Open the door of your heart. Make your body my temple and I'll come in. That is the only religion that counts, is to have the love of God in your heart. In 1973, Berg introduced a practice he calls flirty fishing. His older daughter, Deborah, who left the cult in the late 70s, explains the term. Well, I get, Dad got the terminology from fishing, what Jesus said in the Bible, to go out and fish for men. And so she was going to use the women to fish for the men, to bring the men to the kingdom of God through flirting. Not only the flirting was more than flirting, it was actually, you know, religious prostitution. According to Berg's daughter, Deborah, Berg himself has had an incestuous relationship with his other daughter, Faith, for years, although they both deny that's the case. In fact, a spokesman for Berg told 2020 that he does not advocate incest. Yet Deborah claims her father did approach her for sex, and that was the catalyst to her leaving the cult. My dad was just an evil personality that was not hearing from God at all. I had to quit looking at him as the man as my father, but as a, a leader of a worldwide movement who was destroying people's lives. This was lucrative in multiple ways for Berg, bringing in money in the form of tithes, as well as increasing the size of cult membership through the men brought in from flirty fishing and the children born from these encounters. Berg forbade all types of birth control. He also spread racism and anti-Semitism throughout his teachings, claiming that Hitler was on the right track, describing Africans as savages, and claiming that the world would be ended by a black man. He also called Japan a whole nation of demon worshippers, and described the Chinese people as raw heathens. He was also strongly homophobic, suggesting that children in regular society risk being attacked by homosexuals, and funnily enough, also claimed that a gay man would cause the end of the world. He never specified if the gay man and the black man were the same person or not. I suppose we'll never know. Now from this point, there were many different things going on with the cult over the following years. They pretended to disband because of negative attention their practices were bringing, and they changed their name to the family. The cult's name has changed multiple times throughout their history, and I don't want to confuse anyone by changing what I call them according to the time period I'm speaking about, so I will continue to refer to them as the children of God. As the world moved into the 80s, the cult moved on to more disgusting and unforgivable practices. The Mo letters began to have a direct emphasis on an interest in polygamy, for Berg had taken Karen Zerby, Ricky's mother, who was initially his secretary, as his second wife, as well as adult child sexuality. Berg specifically highlighted his own interest in underage girls and even openly fantasized about his own mother. Berg's depravity seemed to be limitless. 
But the thing about cults is that they condition their followers to accept these obviously insane things very slowly over long, long periods of time. They groom their followers the same way a predator grooms a child. Hello, God bless you, Dad and Maria. We love you very, very much. And it's such a blessing to be able to come into your home and be able to share our hearts with you and how much we really, really love you. And thank you so much for all the letters and for giving your life uh, for Jesus and, and for us. And we need you so much. I joined the family in Houston, Texas in 1972 in December. We know the Lord wants to get us back to Indonesia. I was there before with my son and, um, and my, my previous mate. And um, we really hope to get back as soon as possible. And now the Lord's given me a new mate, Sally. And she's such a blessing. <laughs> and uh, the Lord's really put us together. Amen. And uh, so now I'd like for her to... Say a few words. Hi, Dad and Maria and all the family there. I really love you so much. Um, I'm from England. My name's Sally. I'm 24, a Pisces. And I joined the family 18 months ago. And wherever I went, went whatever country I went to, uh, I never found a real full fulfillment in my life until I found Jesus and asked him into my heart. And what you said about Australians, Dad, is really true. I've done a bit of FFing here, and um, you meet the occasional really receptive and hungry soul, and they're usually younger people here. So now we'd like to introduce you to Joseph. Uh, we know that you've seen him before on the video, and he's, he's been able to share with you. But um, in Sydney, but how did you like Indonesia, Joe, when you were there? Well, it was good because um, it's a new change and it's also really fruitful there. And uh, Recently, uh, Kita shared with us the video that, that just came from World Services and it was so inspiring. It was so beautiful, uh, the love video. And um, it really set us all free just to share as one wife and, and really uh, share together. And it was really a blessing, too, for Joe and Hobo uh, because they had a good chance to, to share also with Sally. Amen. And uh, so the Lord's really, really setting us freer and freer to, to obey and to be free and, and to show that, that sample of freedom and love to the world. Well, God bless you. Thank you very much for this chance to be able to share Amen. real personally with you. And, and we love you so very much. And we pray for you all the time and we need you so much and uh, we love you very very much and god bless you amen god bless you we love you dad and maria and david ito and techie god bless you bye my maria and techie and the children do say they've never had any sexual experiences with adults or other children but they become extremely agitated when we ask them about Moses David Berg's teachings on sex. My Little Fish. Now, your father described that as a routine publication Ooh. that entails uh, Who graphic had this? sex. Who had this? I don't have any sex. They're just kissing and hugging in bed. That's not sex. If you show it to other people, they don't understand. That stuff's not supposed to be publicized. So many people hate. So many people think sex is wrong. So many people hate us. But we just telling them the truth. We're just telling them it's not wrong. We're just telling them that there's nothing wrong with them. And here comes these publicizers doing them to everybody, making everybody think it's wrong. This is printed and circulated. <laughs> Why do you it's need it? You don't need it. It's not a private uh, doc. It's printed and widely circulated around the world. You're not supposed to have it. <laughs> That isn't to say that all the children of God were accepting of these teachings. Many left and were speaking to the media about their experiences, driving David Berg and his inner circle deeper and deeper into hiding. Though his location was unknown at the time to most, he continued to produce and distribute Mo letters to his followers. It was during these years in hiding and on the run throughout Europe, Africa, and Asia that Ricky was born. Born as David Moses Zerbe, his name was later changed to Richard Peter Rodriguez. Berg and Zerbe believed that Ricky was a divine prince, sent to lead them and their followers through the end times. 
His upbringing, which consisted of constant religious indoctrination, strict discipline, and sexual abuse beginning at age one at the hands of his nannies and his own mother, was consistently documented and sent out in the Mo letters to the rest of the cult members as an example of how their followers were expected to raise their own children. The following is a timeline of Ricky's life. Ricky was born on January 25, 1975, in Tenerife, Spain. His biological father is believed to have been a man named Carlos who was a waiter at the hotel that his mother, Berg, and the rest of their group were staying at. It was during these first few years that the story of Davidito was published, a partially illustrated Mo letter detailing Ricky's abuse at the hands of his mother and nannies. This publication featured blatant photos of the sexual abuse that Ricky was already being subjected to. Despite the children of God to this day denying that any wrongdoing was ever done on their part, all photos displaying nudity and inappropriate interactions between Ricky and an adult, the adult's faces are illustrated over in this eerie retro comic book style that clearly shows that they knew that what they were doing was and will always be wrong. The story of Davidito is 762 pages long. Ricky was raised with an adopted sister known as Davida, who endured the same abuse and worse according to Ricky's own words, alongside him and with him. The next couple of entries are going to go by kind of quick as far as the grand scope of things, they're fairly uneventful and for efficiency we are going to lightly gloss over them. In 1977, Ricky, his mother, and Berg leave Tenerife and live across many towns in Spain such as Madeira, Estoril, Portugal, and Madrid, Berg fleeing charges for flirty fishing across many countries. In 1978, they live in Switzerland and Malta. In 1979, Ricky separates from Berg and Zerbi on a temporary basis, and he lives in southern France until 1980. In June of 1980, Ricky joins Berg and Zerbi again in Cape Town, South Africa. 1981 to 1987, Ricky bounces around multiple locations such as Portugal, Sri Lanka, and Singapore before rejoining Berg and Zerbi in Metro Manila, Philippines. It is during this time, at the age of 10, that Ricky is put on the sharing lists, marking him as sexually available to be shared among members of the group. Berg had begun inserting suggestions of incest to his followers during this time, and Ricky had intercourse with his own mother at the age of 12, with his sister and David Berg in bed next to them. These people are truly sickening, and all in the name of God. Berg also began having his child followers as young as 8 and 9 being made to dance suggestively in sheer clothing on film to be sent back to him for his own sick pleasures. It was during these years that Berg's granddaughter Mary, better known as Meanie, came to live with her grandfather after the suicide of her father, Berg's own son. As the years went by, Meanie was abused by her grandfather, and the abuse was observed by Zerbi. Meanie and Ricky were eventually paired together by Berg, his intention for her to become pregnant and continue his line, even though Ricky was not his biological son to begin with. Eventually, Zerbi grew jealous that Meanie would take her place as Berg's wife, and Meanie was placed into a Children of God practice called Teen Training. It was in Teen Training that, at the direction of Zerbi, Meanie was viciously beaten on a regular basis, tied to the bed, thrown against the wall, and even exercised multiple times. It was the witnessing of the abuse of Meanie that planted the first seeds in Ricky's mind of doubt and repulsion in Berg, his mother, and the cult as a whole. Meanie, who was dad's granddaughter, came to live with us when she was about 12. And I remember very clearly dad talking to us about her coming. And he said, look, this is my granddaughter. And I haven't seen her since she was, I don't know, one or two years old. And I want to take care of her. Meanie lives with Berg for four years during which time she suffers several mental breakdowns. Not knowing how to handle her, the family tries non-traditional means. We believe in exorcism, we believe in laying hands and praying for people, and we did that for her sometimes. And, and there were times when we did pray for her that she had 
you know, for a few months was doing fine, but then she would relapse into it. Later, Mimi will accuse her grandfather of sexual abuse. It's funny, I always thought that, uh, you know, if I, I used to think a lot about suicide. It's, it actually, believe it or not, it should have started a long time ago. It should have started when I was fucking born, actually. But to tell you the truth, it didn't really start in earnest until the infamous teen training happened. Yes, teen training. And, man, I started thinking, wow. How could I do it? I was, well, I wasn't the oldest. I was the oldest for a long time, but of course, at team training, there was uh, a bunch of girls there that were older than I was. But, you know, <laughs> let me tell you, <laughs> suicide is not something that you talked about with people, anybody. Or, you know, are you going to turn into a fucking meanie case? They beat the devil out of you, or whatever. Just fucking insane. Where the fuck was I? Suicide. Yes, suicide. Horrible. Horrible thing when adults contemplate suicide. But so much worse when you got a fucking little kid who is, you know, not born to be a messed up little fucker, but he's a little life, you know? It's just so far beyond me, I just can't fucking imagine it. But yet it happened. It happened right before me. It happened to all of you. Thousands of us. Some worse than others. I had it good in many ways. I was a guy, you know? A lot of you girls, psh, crap. I can't even compare my stories with yours. But that's not what this is about. We're not sitting here comparing, oh, you got it worse than I did. You got it more times than I did. Because it's not about that. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh yeah, I had it the worst. Or I didn't. Because it doesn't really matter. It should never have happened at all to anybody. That's the point. So that's when I started contemplating suicide. And I've been fucking thinking about it ever since. Yep. As kids, we didn't always get along that well with me because she was older. She was better at playing the game than we were. We were just little fuckers who were trying to have fun, and, and she um, set the bar so high because they really did grade on the curve that, uh, that it made it tough for us. But, you know, none of us, none of us um, rejoiced when that happened to her. Nobody, nobody deserved that, especially not a kid that age. So, I watched every day new bruises on her, big fucking fat fucking bruises. And I started thinking to myself, holy fuck, you know, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way how one person can stand up to a group of strong men. There's got to be some sort of equalizer. And I found that equalizer in edged weapons and training. In 1986, due to mounting pressure from the outside world learning of the cult's sickening practices, Berg officially called for a stop to all sexual interactions with children within the cult. How much of this actually stopped is certainly up for debate. The following year, Berg called an into flirty fishing as well, but not for any moral reason, but because of the rise of the AIDS epidemic. At this point, I want to address something. There is a misconception regarding male victims of sexual abuse, particularly when it comes to young boys and older women. There is absolutely no sort of mental gymnastics that you can go through that can truly justify a fully grown adult taking advantage of a child whose brain is not fully developed yet and cannot accurately gauge whether something like that is good for them or not. Period. End of story. The same goes for all the sexual encounters that Ricky was placed into as a teenager. 
I know that there are those out there that would claim at this point that he was not being abused, that he wanted to be involved. But you have to understand that child predators use a tactic known as grooming, a slow and steady process of normalization to train the child's mind to recognize awful behavior as normal, or even good. Ricky was not, and was never, in the right state of mind to make any kind of sexual decision while under the care of Berg and his mother, because he was a child. Rant over. Back to Ricky. From 1987 to 1988, Ricky moved with Berg and Zerby to the Tokyo, Japan area. Ricky attends the Heavenly City School, the largest and most famous school in Japan. From 1988 to 1993, Berg and Zerby moved to the Vancouver area in Canada, where they are forced to flee in 1993 after being caught up to by officials. Ricky spends this time living with Children of God communities in the U.S. and Australia, with Steve Kelly, his mother's common-law husband. In 1991, Berg orders all copies of the Book of Davidito to be destroyed. Ricky is made to undergo, and I say this with the least amount of weight that I can give to it, a psychological evaluation to prove that Ricky's abuse perpetrated by Children of God members had no negative effect on him. May 1993 to 1994. Travels with Berg and Zerby settling back in Portugal. David Berg dies at the age of 75 of unspecified medical causes. 1995 to 1996. Ricky spends time in Russia and Hungary working various handyman jobs within Children of God homes. This was the first period of Ricky's life that he enjoyed any kind of freedom. He spent a lot of time drinking and partying until his mother demanded he come back home. Ricky was socializing with people outside of the cult for the first time and had spoken to a few people about his experiences growing up within the inner circle of the children of God and where it had made its way back to his mother. It was during this time that he met his future wife Elixia in one of the family homes. They fell in love and became engaged and Ricky only agreed to return home to his mother if Elixia could come as well. From 1997 to 1999, Ricky spends this time in his mother's compound in Portugal, formulating his plan to eventually leave with his fiance. In 2000, Ricky leaves his mother in her secret base in Portugal and spends time in California, Venezuela, and England. He writes a letter to one of the top Children of God members in November. I had to act different parts and play different roles all of my life, and I was just plain tired of it. The next month, in an email to a former leader of the church, Ricky said, I didn't appreciate being treated like a commodity by my mother. Some days I have come so close to snapping and going back to their compound, but not for a social visit and not as a repentant prodigal, but as an avenger. I don't see why I should have to pay for their sins. In January of 2001, Ricky officially leaves the children of God with his longtime partner, Elixia. He then works on fishing boats from Seattle for three months. Ricky and Alexia then marry and settle in Tacoma, Washington. They had no credit, no driver's license, or driving ability at all. Alexia said in an interview that they didn't even know how to write a check. Ricky begins to work in Tacoma as an electrician. During this time, Ricky's depression evolved and deepened. He struggled to handle his anger towards his mother and all the others who had wronged him since his birth. Despite encouragement from his wife, he was afraid to see a professional, for one of his deepest fears was being thought of as crazy and being imprisoned as Meany had been. After a minor car accident, something inside Ricky said it was time to leave. He told his wife that he needed to take some time away. He packed a bag, and he left. I thought it would help more, I guess, for me, but I think I'm just really fucked in the head. Uh, I've tried so many things, trying to uh, trying to somehow fit in, somehow to find you know a normal life. Now everybody's gonna, everybody has said who I've talked to about this. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, everybody has their problems. Everybody has a fucked up life. But those people who say that, you know, they had no clue as to what actually went on because they weren't part of the cult. These are just average systemites that I talked to, well, man, I'm so happy for them. <laughs> I'm so happy that, you know, yeah, sure they, you know, didn't have a perfect home, but I don't think most fam other family kids can relate to this because 
yeah, they were abused. But one thing I don't think they were that much is secluded. And that really can fuck you over. Because if you don't have that um, mirror, if you will, of other kids your own age, um, even kids older than you, you know, older siblings, whatever, friends, then uh, it really fucks you up. And I was reading... In 2004, Ricky spent some time in Southern California, then Tucson, Arizona. During this span of time, he stayed with some former Children of God members. He began to formulate a plan. Cut off the head of the snake and watch the body die. He decides that he needs to find his mother. On January 7, 2005, Ricky sits down at his kitchen table, listening to Sum 41's newest album Chuck, drinking beer and loading the clip of a gun. He records a video detailing his intentions. On January 8th, Ricky kills Angela Smith, his former nanny and abuser featured in the Book of Davidito. He does this in his apartment in Tucson, Arizona. She no longer lived in Children of God homes and lived with a local partner in Palo Alto, California. Ricky contacted her and convinced her that he was on good terms with other family members. Under the guise of a friendly dinner, she drives to his apartment. He speaks to her about the abuses he endured at her hands and the hands of others, and she shows no signs of recognizing that anything that she did was wrong whatsoever. This infuriates Ricky as well as deeply saddens him. In a fit of rage and revenge, Ricky stabs her five times with his customized K-bar knife and slits her throat ear to ear for good measure. I've seen the autopsy papers and it sounds like he nearly decapitated her. When the act is done and he begins to look around and fully comprehend what he's done, he tosses the knife under the couch and leaves. January 9th, in the earliest hours of the day, Ricky got in his car and began to drive west. He called his wife and he told her that it was a lot harder to kill someone than he imagined it would be. He called her again at a gas station in Phoenix, crying. As he said, no, I don't want to die here. There's too much light. I'm not comfortable. He drove until he got to Blythe, California, where my grandparents actually met in high school. He checked into a Holiday Inn, paid $100 for his room, took a shower, and drank some beer and ate some beef jerky. At that point, Ricky went back to his car and drove three quarters of a mile to the Palo Verde Irrigation District office parking lot and parked. He placed his phone in the center console, put a pistol to his temple, and pulled the trigger. His body was found around 7 in the morning and was pronounced dead by the coroner shortly after. For the next few minutes of this video, I want to let you hear Ricky's own thoughts from his own mouth, because I feel like honestly it's the most important part of this episode. Getting back to suicide, that's what I wanted to do. Then, I would kill myself. And God, how I want to do that. How I want to follow that scenario. I just want to leave. It's been a few months and then end it. But you know what? I feel that that would be the selfish thing to do. That would be the way, the quitter's way out. Because, yeah, I'm sort of quitting right now, but in a way I'm not. Because I'm not doing it the way I want to do it. I'm trying to do something lasting. Something that if God forbid in the next life I, it does go on, um, that I can look back on this if I'm able to and, and know that, okay, maybe I didn't technically do the right thing, but I tried to do something to help. I didn't just fade away. I didn't just turn tail and run and let those fuckers win that I did what I could to make a difference. And I don't really know how far I'm going to get. I'm starting to think now that it's not going to be that far. And that's going to suck ass. I might not uh, get one person, that's for sure. But anyway, well, my main incentive in this is knowing that not only will it make me feel a whole fuck of a lot better, but 
that maybe it'll bring... I mean, I can just see all those fucking thousands of family kids, you know, who've been abused. What about us? Where's our apology? They're not even fucking sorry. They're not even fucking sorry. But can you imagine? All of a sudden, to hear one day, guess what? Mom and Peter are fucking dead. Yeah, somebody went into their house or their fucking motorhome or whatever. They poured gasoline on them. They lit a match. And we had a fucking barbecue. Wow. Can you imagine? I can imagine putting myself in this place, how it would make me feel if I heard that somebody did that. It would be like, wow, there is justice in this world. And an incredible weight would be lifted off my shoulders and I would be able to go on with my life. Yeah, I don't really have anything to lose, I think. And, uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't want to go through my life um, the way it is now. I've tried for four years. Sure, it's not long. Feels like a fucking lifetime. It feels like a goddamn lifetime to me. And uh, every day, you know, if it had just gotten a little better, a little better, even emotionally, mentally for me, it would have been okay. It would have given me hope. But it's gotten worse. Every fucking day has been a little worse than the day before. Kind of reminds me of that movie Office Space, where he's talking to the hypnotherapist. <laughs> and he says that. I said, every day has been a little worse than before. And the guy goes, oh, that's fucked up. And then he catches himself and apologizes. But yeah, it's fucked up. It's really fucked up. Uh, but hey, it's life. And we're going to play the hand that we're dealt. I got in contact with my sister. Well, I consider her my sister because to me she is. She's not flesh and blood. But uh, I'm talking about uh, Davida. She calls me sometimes and we talk. Tells me the stuff she's going through. And it just breaks my heart, you know? Because I, I want to help her, but there's nothing I can do because it's all up here, you know? The damage has been done. I'm not saying she's crazy, but she has nightmares at night. I guess a lot of us do. I have nightmares. Not really about the same things, but about the cult. Um, she has nightmares about, you know, being dragged out of bed in the middle of the night to go have sex with uh, Berg. God damn. I can only imagine what my sister goes through. I was telling somebody today how uh, how different my sister, This Is Tetchy, um, became after, after the Tetchy series. It's just... So sad to watch that. To see her retreat into herself. And, and now Sue calls me today, tells me how great, you know, my sister's doing. That's been actually one of the hardest things lately for me is to have to, you know, pretend like I'm making peace with these fucking perverts. You know, you just want to grab them and rip their throat out and, you know, I gotta be nice. My mom's gonna pay for that. She's gonna pay dearly, one way or another. If I don't get to her, man, if I don't get to her and life goes on, I'm gonna keep hunting her in the next life, let me tell you. And I'm gonna keep going until somebody gets her, or I get her, justice will be done, believe me. It's only a matter of time. Somehow, some way, it's gonna happen. I'm gonna try to do my part. We'll see what happens and go from there. This is my boss always says. We'll see what happens, Rick, and then we'll go from there. He's such a cool guy. He's like the best boss in the world, I think. And that's actually one of my main regrets here, having to do this, is to have to leave him, desert him, because I know he needs me. He has other guys working with him, thankfully, or it would make it so much harder for me to do this. But still, I wrote him a long note, tried to explain what little I could. What can you say, you know? What can you say? Anyway. Okay, well, I'm going to take a break now. Maybe think of something else useful to say. But, yeah, I mean, I guess I fucking said all I, I can say. And 
what can I say, you know? <clears throat> what can I fucking say? <clears throat> have a peaceful, happy life. I tried. I did. Maybe I didn't try hard enough. Gave it what I could, you know. I did. Um, yeah, well, I guess I'm going to go now. Uh, I wanted to see that movie White Noise just because I'm sort of interested in the afterlife. I know it's just a fucking movie, but it looked cool, so... I like movies. I think it's because I was, wasn't was allowed to watch that many. Yeah, sure, I watched some with Berg and all, but yeah. It's kind of cool to watch movies now. So, uh, I guess I'm going to go watch that one. Drink some beers. Be happy. What more could you want, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, well, keep the, keep fighting, keep the faith, and all that other stuff. And someday, in some way, some of us are going to be around to see those fuckers burn. Literally or figuratively. They're going down. So, with that happy thought, I shall leave you. On March 26th, 2005, a memorial is held for Ricky and all other lost former members of the Children of God. His wife, sister, and loved ones were in attendance. He was searching for his meaning in life. He really was. And I think he finally came up with the conclusion that his his reason for living was to make right his mother's wrongs. As Rick drove to his death, he called his wife, 1,500 miles away, in Tacoma, one last time. He said the hardest thing about it is that as she was dying, he said she didn't understand what she had done. And I'm like, who? He's like, she didn't get it. These people don't get it. He says, I wasn't expecting that answer. I don't understand how they could not see what they have done. It's pretty extraordinary to want to kill your own mother, isn't it? Well, when your mother fucks you as a child, and instead of being your mother, loving and, you know, and endearing and teaching you in the right ways, instead, you know, when you fuck your little boy, that, that, that'll do that to you. That, that might make you want to kill your mother when you grow up. It really does fuck your head up. Ricky's story is one of the most heartbreaking I've ever encountered. Sadly, he never really had much of a chance, despite how desperately he longed for a normal life. Despite being so full of anger and that need for revenge, it is very clear, at least to me, from watching his video, that he was filled with just as much love and empathy. I wish he had been given a better life. And while I don't condone his taking the law into his own hands, I can certainly understand where his feelings came from. Over 200 second generation ex-Children of God members have committed suicide. This episode is dedicated to Ricky's memory and to the memory of all the other victims of the Children of God cult. I don't claim to know what comes after this life ends, but my heart aches from the pain you all endured and I hope you finally have found peace. I wish you could have found it sooner. If you or anyone you know is being abused or thinking of ending things, please speak out. You are not alone, and there is a world of love and support waiting for you if you only look in the right places. Karen Zerby and her husband Peter Kelly are the leaders of the group to this day, currently operating as the Family International. Though they have renounced the sexual deviancy spread by David Berg, it's clear that Karen shows no real remorse for any of her actions. She's clearly stated that they have only said what they need to say to appease the authorities. I'm including a petition to have Karen Zerby and the Family International investigated by the FBI and Interpol and finally be brought to justice.
Thank you so much for watching this first episode of True Grime. Making this first episode was quite an experience and I hope to only improve my content for you guys as we move into the future. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a comment with your thoughts or a topic suggestion for my next video. And always remember, monsters from the grimiest places often have the prettiest faces. <laughs>